This session is the stormwater parks and other multi-benefit stormwater strategy session. Um, I am Maitha Sinha. I am an engineer with King County Stormwater Services. Hi, I'm Hannah Kett, and I am the uh, work at the Nature Conservancy. We'll be facilitating this session with our wonderful speakers today. Um, a quick overview of this session. Um, we'll be discussing stormwater parks and um, specific case studies or projects that have happened across the region, as well as tools and resources that um, can help support and move along these projects as we um, try to continue bringing on more stormwater treatment strategies into the region and our practices. Um, so I'll hand it to Hannah. I'm just going to introduce our first two speakers who are um, Jenny Gauss and Erica Harris. Um, Michelle wasn't able to join us, but they're going to cover some of her content. Um, Jenny works as a strategic surface water advisor for the city of Kirkland. Her current focus is on stormwater retrofit planning, and in particular, how to maximize the benefits of stormwater facilities by combining them with parks, greenways, and other community needs and interests. Jenny has used her education in engineering and forest ecology to address municipal surface water issues of aquatic habitat, water quality, and flood reduction for the past 30 years. Erica is a planner in the Growth Management Group at the Puget Sound Regional Council, and she has over 15 years of experience in environmental, urban, and regional planning. At PSRC, Erica works on comprehensive plan review, open space planning, advancing racial equity, Puget Sound recovery, and other issues at the intersection of planning and sustainability. So I'll turn it over to you two. Thank you. We're excited to talk about stormwater parks with you all. Um, again, my name is Erica Harris. I'm a planner at Puget Sound Regional Council, and um, we're the regional planning agency for King, Kitsap, Snohomish, and Pierce counties. Um, a lot of you might know that we do transportation funding, but we also have a big integrated regional plan called Vision 2050. And uh, Vision 2050 has lots of different policies, including Puget Sound recovery and community health. So we see stormwater parks as a really important strategy that, to meet those goals and many others as well. So uh, we're defining stormwater parks as regional stormwater facilities. So uh, managing stormwater from a large area from an entire basin, maybe even hundreds of acres, um, and also providing a recreation. So it could be trails, community gardens, play areas, any, any type of recreation that the community wants. Um, so with um, besides providing stormwater and recreation, uh, stormwater parks can also advance racial equity when they're built in areas that are underserved by parks. And of course, uh, because they help with water quality, they can also help support tribal treaty rights. Um, and a lot of parks don't actually have a lot of wildlife habitat. So when you add a kind of more natural stormwater feature like a constructed wetland, it can also provide a wildlife habitat. And then uh, stormwater parks are interdisciplinary projects. So um, it can be difficult in some ways, but they can also uh, get a lot of different funding sources. So uh, because stormwater parks are such an important Puget Sound recovery strategy, we did receive a national uh, estuary program grant for promoting stormwater parks. Um, and I just want to say PSRC does not build stormwater parks, uh, but we do share really good ideas across the region. Um, so that's what that's why we're getting involved. Um, so there are some stormwater parks that have already been built in the region, um, and we want to make sure that we um, share those stories. So we did we do have profiles of stormwater parks um, on our stormwater parks website. You can see the the address there. Um, and then we looked at um, opportunities to build stormwater parks region wide and provided technical assistance uh, through AHBL for uh, planning six new stormwater parks. I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, and then the last part of the project was to develop a guidance document on planning stormwater parks. So that, that early planning part, um, and that was recently released. So I'll briefly go through some examples of stormwater parks that have already been built. 
Um, we don't have a lot of time, but all of these are on our website. Um, this stormwater wetland park in the city of Arlington um, retrofits the Old Town Arlington. Of, that's 280 acres. Uh, and that this is kind of one of the larger stormwater parks because it's a constructed wetland. So it takes up nine acres, but it also provides um, a lot of different recreational components, including public access to the Stelaguamish River. Uh, the city of Bellevue's Lakemont Community Park is one of the oldest stormwater parks in the region, and um, it was built by the developer uh, while they were developing the surrounding neighborhood. They turned it over to the city um, once it was built, so very cost effective for the city. Manchester Stormwater Park is probably one of the most famous stormwater parks, and we'll get that um, to that in a little while. We'll get some more details on this one. Another developer uh, built stormwater park in the city of Palsbo is this Mountaineer Stormwater Ponds and Trails. Um, and the community really enjoys the walking around and enjoying the wildlife. Uh, the city of Seattle's Mad Madison Valley Stormwater Improvements was built primarily for flood control. It's actually on a couple of sites. And the, one, the picture here is from their um, Lake Washington Park. Uh, project, but there's also another one that I saw a photo earlier, uh, I shared a photo earlier, and that one is, I think it's on John Street. Um, the city of Shoreline, when they did a major renovation to Cromwell Park, uh, added a constructed wetland to this, um, to this park, and the community, again, really enjoys the wildlife that uh, wasn't there before it was built. Um, some of you may have heard of the point Defiant Stormwater Facility. And um, this is a really, um, this stormwater park does a lot in a small area. It treats 754 acres um, and only 5,500 square feet. And it provides some visual interest and, and some walking areas around the entrance of Point Defiance Park. So this is not in the region, but I wanted to share an ultra urban stormwater park. Uh, this one is in the Pearl District and it's really nicely designed. has a lot of art features. Um, and so I hope we see a, a park like this um, in our region soon. And a couple of others that are just really nice, nice design and some nice art is this one in China on the left and Illinois on the right. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit about the stormwater parks that received our technical assistance. I won't go into a lot of details, but again, these are all in our stormwater parks guidance. Um, this one in the city of Lakewood, or sorry, Linwood, um, is there a Maple Mini Park? And it's going to improve ADA access and a lot of other things about that park and provide a lot more stormwater treatment. The city of Marysville, uh, when they did their uh, SMAP process, if you're familiar with that, looking at places to put stormwater retrofits, this was um, the number one priority for their, um, for their SMAP process. So they were able to use our technical assistance to, to find, figure out where to put stormwater treatment in this uh, in Jennings Park. Uh, the Sea of Pialup Stormwater Park actually is taking a road runoff from a very busy road and uh, treating it. So that, that's a nice feature of this one. Um, and the city of Woodenville um, and their uh, stormwater park, they're uh, adding a pickleball for it. I guess pickleball is very popular right now. So that's kind of an unusual feature as well as a, a bike trail. So I won't go through all of these lessons learned, and there are a lot more in our stormwater parks uh, guidance document, um, but I, I just wanted to mention a few. Um, public engagement is very important. All of these stormwater parks very, look very different because they did use um, the public's ideas and their, their community's ideas for what they wanted to see there. Um, and also having some uh, Multiple uh, departments work together has been really helpful to find new opportunities for stormwater parks. Um, as you saw in the examples, some of these are um, parks that added a stormwater feature. Uh, some are stormwater facilities that added park and recreation features, and some are undeveloped places that added both. Um, so it, it really shows that there are a lot of opportunities across the region for adding these types of facilities. Um, and they also vary a lot in the design and, and the size and the cost. So um, again, there's a lot of flexibility of these. Um, I just wanted to do a quick plug on our planning stormwater parks 
guidance document. Um, these are some of the steps that uh, are suggested. They don't necessarily have to go in a linear order, um, especially integrating equity and engaging the community. That really needs to happen throughout the process. And that's where our stormwater parks guidance document is. Um, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Jenny and then I'll pop up again to cover a few of Michelle's slides. Okay, thank you very much um, for this opportunity. I'm super excited that this screen is about as large as some parks in Kirkland. We're, we're a very um, dense, urban area, and this is just fantastic. So um, so I will tell you a little bit about the stormwater park that Kirkland developed as part of our PSRC project, then uh, a little bit about some other stormwater parks that we have done in Kirkland, and then about a project that I'm working on now that hopefully will lead to more stormwater parks in the future. So. Wait, it's forward. Aha. Okay. So we worked on the North Rose Hill open space for stormwater park. And one of the first things we need is a better title that acknowledges uh, its rainwater function and its stormwater function. <laughs> um, and we chose this uh, piece of property because it was uh, identified as a gap in our parks, recreation and open space plan, um, pros plan. Uh, there was also a desire for a citywide trail connection. It is below a uh, power line and they wanted a citywide trail connection. And really, it was kind of a blank slate from the parks uh, side of things, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, from the stormwater concern side, we had worked with Jason Jacobs in this area on retrofit planning because this area drains to Forbes Creek, and we have a lot of uh, stormwater problems in Forbes Creek. And so um, we were very interested, and we had actually identified this site as one of our sites through that process. About 18 acres of upstream area drains through it. And we have um, some lots of stormwater issues that I'll go into in a sec here. So here's a little bit about the existing conditions. Again, it's really a blank slate. It's got nothing on it. There are lots of invasive species. It's kind of a forgotten. Some of the neighbors feel like it's their backyard, but beyond that, not too many people go through it. Um, it's got Again, the power line easement, it's got a stormwater pipe going through the middle of it that's failing and that we need to fix anyway. So um, just kind of this blank slate that had some needs that we thought we could meet while doing a stormwater park. And here's what it looks like. Again, just total blank slate. Oh. So uh, through the technical assistance, uh, we decided that we wanted to learn very quickly about the soils on the site. Um, infiltration is our preferred way of doing stormwater management where we can. And so the earlier um, whether we know, the earlier we know whether we can do that or not, the better. Um, and then we got some topographic survey just to start to get ready for uh, a design. And then we had a HBL draw us up some preliminary designs to say, you know, what, what, what are some ideas? What could we do here? And out of that came a design for above ground bioretention. We found that the soils were not good uh, for deep infiltration as we had hoped. Um, and so we added uh, biofiltration along with some regional trails and some overlooks and lots of native plantings. Our uh, Green Kirkland program identified this as a site where they wanted to see pollinators. And so we had a focus on native plants and pollinators in the planting design. Um, so that's, that's that project and lessons learned. Um, we really found that we have to let parks lead. I'll get into this more in a, in a moment. Uh, we identified this through a pros plan that was actually an old pros plan. Parks was in the middle of doing a new pros plan while we were, uh, working on this site, um, in the new pros plan. This is no longer a gap. Um, and parks is really a, a big ship to steer in terms of public involvement. Um, there, um, the, the level of public engagement is very, very large and very, very good in our community. And so what they find out through that process really, um, I would say leads more than stormwater. We, we would love to think that people care about stormwater and that it's their top of mind, but it's, it's really, you know, it's, Parks are really more get people, you know, that's our living rooms, right? And so people are just much more like 
willing to come out and tell you what they want in a park. And so our, our lesson learned is really to let parks lead in terms of where we do this type of work. Um, and then just, again, the site specific, get, get the more information you can about your soils and your whatnot. That's the engineer and me talking. So, um, and then I would advocate for some matched funding. Uh, we have other projects I'll talk about in a minute where we managed to get uh, funding from the stormwater side. It was still difficult to get funding for the park side. And the other thing is when you're dealing with those two silos, figuring out whose peanut butter is and whose chocolate and figuring out all the accounting of that is extremely difficult. So, um, so some other efforts that we've done in Kirkland, uh, we have done the 132nd square park, which is about 50 acres that we are able to drain and infiltrate underneath the park. Um, we got ecology funding for both the planning and the design and construction of this project, and that has been fantastic. Um, and then on the park side, uh, when I initially started the project, there was plans for just a minor sort of field restoration and redo. It was a little bumpy, you know, so just, just kind of minor redo. Uh, but as we moved through the process, our city council felt that they wanted uh, artificial turf and lights. At more pro at, so people can have more places to play uh, throughout the year. And um, this park came up as a top candidate for that and really pushed the whole project forward. Um, that uh, caused our parks department to have quite the um, very uh, tight time frame for doing the master planning around that. And um, uh, they managed to do that. It was it was not easy, um, but that really helped the whole project move forward, and that will open on April first. Uh, and then, hang on, sorry, there was one more. Oh, and then we had another park where it didn't work. And if you want more details about that, I can talk about that at the panel. Um, we had a park that we identified from a stormwater perspective as being a fantastic candidate. Fifty acres drained to it. Us stormwater engineers were all just excited. And then it turned out that it was not in a gap in the pros plan. It was not in a priority area. Um, and parks just did not have the funding to move forward with the master plan. So even though we had secured ecology funding, we had done our 30% design, we had, you know, we were pretty far along in the process. Parks was like, we just can't, we just don't have the, the resources to do the public engagement. So that one is on hold. Um, and that leads to sort of our lessons learned, which is um, our next project, which is looking at parks and stormwater. So our strategy with this is to try to get ahead of the game, to look at each park uh, and say, you know, what stormwater management facilities and types could we do at that park? Also to look at our stormwater owned properties and say, you know, what could we do at each of those that might be a park? And we want to do that so that we are ready because we know that pros plans happen and those set the priorities. We also know that things change uh, and things can shift very quickly. And so we feel like if we are ready with some ideas and some sizing and, you know, just sort of have our homework done, um, that we'll be much in a much better position to work with parks when opportunities arise and to also use that um, information to look for funding. So. So that project is ongoing. We just started it again using our new pros plan. So, um, okay, yeah, and this is just showing uh, what we do for that project, which is we review everything on GIS. Then we start drawing our basins for our parks. Then we start looking out in the field at what we could do there, and then we mesh all of that with parks uh, opportunities and park priorities. So, okay, so now do you want to talk through? Okay, so Michelle sadly could not be here today. We hope she, we wish her well. Um, and Erica will go through just real quickly some of her slides. Thanks, Jenny. I'm really excited about that um, Kirkland Parks and Stormwater Project. I've actually heard a few jurisdictions now doing similar analyses. So I'm hoping I see more and more of that um, everywhere really. Uh, so um, Michelle sends her regrets, she's sick. Um, she's a great speaker, so if you want to see her presentation, you, you can actually find a link on our Stormwater Parks page, and we did a, a recorded session, so you could see what they're doing. Uh, Kitsap County has really been a leader in Stormwater Parks, um, and they, they actually have, uh, this is the th a third one that they're working on now with our technical assistance. So 
Um, I'll, I'll say that um, their water as a resource policy was really instrumental in like pushing them in this direction. So, um, and uh, so I would say add that policy to your comp plan if you can. Um, so we're, we're gonna recommend that um, at the regional council level too in, the, in our next plan. So um, their first stormwater park was uh, Manchester Stormwater Park. Um, you can see that you know it was a kind of a big empty site. Um, it had a lot of issues around it. So they were able to kind of use that water as a resource policy to uh, make it into a community amenity and, and fix their, their stormwater issues. Um, I won't go into a lot of details because I don't know them. But um, I do want to say they did a lot of community engagement with this project. And um, one nice thing is the community wanted to have a place for their flea market. So that's why you see kind of a big open space because that's, that's where the community gathers for that. They also wanted a place where they could put their holiday tree um, in December. So they have their big uh, you know, holiday gathering there and they, they just have a special hole in the ground and they, they put their tree up. So there's just lots of very, very cool aspects to it. It also um, takes care of the um, road runoff from the surrounding. So you know, you hear more about 6PPD, but you know, I think this is a, you know, another important reason why we need things like this to take care of that problem. Um, so their next um, project was Whispering Furs. Um, and we have links to that as well. So I won't, I think I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna go through these. Um, they did think a lot about equity and the third project they're, they're working on, I know is like it's the most diverse area of Kitsap County. So um, they were thinking about how to fill those park gaps and those types of areas. Um, and this is the concept design for the Buckland Tracyton Stormwater Park. And uh, you can kind of see that there's a bit of a salmon head at the top there. Um, so they, they kind of had fun with that and they're planning on doing a, a lot of cool things that the community has asked for, including um, things like uh, wildflowers um, for their pollinators. I will skip the lessons learned um, and then pass it on to the Nature Conservancy. I think Josh, you're next. All right. Thank you, Erica and Jenny, for the wonderful talks on stormwater parks and the work that you've been doing. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our next speakers from TNC. Um, first, we'll have Josh Rubenstein. Um, Josh is a conserv conservation policy associate with the Washington chapter of the Na Nature Conservancy. His background is in policy analysis and advocacy, environmental education, immigrant justice, and ski bumming. Love that. <laughs> um, and then also joining Josh, we have Kate Sievers. Kate is a project manager with the Washington chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Um, prior to joining the Conservancy, she, was, she served as a bioenvironmental engineer in the Air Force for almost 10 years. Um, thank you both for joining us. I'll pass it on to Josh to take us on to the next set of presentations. Thank you for those introductions. And Kate and I are gonna be presenting two new tools that the Nature Conservancy is publishing um, to help accelerate the use of GSI in the region. So first I'm presenting Retrofitting Our Legacy, Green Strategies for Treating Urban Stormwater. This is a policy white paper and it is available on this table here in the front, it is available on the table uh, with all the goodies outside and will also be available online shortly. Um, this paper is broken down into five kind of overarching common sense strategies with many sub strategies and case stories in those. Um, and it is intended for policymakers and practitioners who want to accelerate the use of GSI to meet our water quality problems. Um, really invite anyone, it doesn't have to be someone working at a local jurisdiction, although this is uh, especially intended for folks working at jurisdictions. Um, this is, this is an issue we, we are all here because we're working on. So why this project? It's something TNC has been working on for um, six years now. 
And you've got a map here of our stormwater heat map showing total suspended solids on the left. And you can see that it's basically a road map. Um, we've known for decades that road pollution is incredibly toxic. We've known now for a couple of years specifically about 6PPD being a, a particularly bad chemical in that toxic mix. And the scale of our road system is immense. To get to clean water, we're going to need to treat that. Luckily, we also know a lot about what works. We know that green stormwater infrastructure is very effective at treating road runoff. Um, the challenge is really bringing that to scale, to the scale of our roads. So I'm going to go through these strategies. I'm going to pick some of the information in this paper to share with you all. Um, it is not all of it, so please do go check it out. Oh, I want to go back to this slide for one more moment. Um, we need to be going beyond what our permits are requiring right now. So the, the stormwater permit for um, municipalities just doesn't require them to work at the scale of our problem. And so um, many municipalities in this area, and we've heard just now from Erica and from Jenny about uh, municipalities that are going above and beyond the permit to treat stormwater and to treat road runoff. Uh, and, and that's what these tools are for. So strategy one, go big because home is polluted. We need to be taking a watershed perspective and, and doing this work where it's gonna have the most impact on water quality. And that really means focusing on toxic hotspots and environmental justice. So I've got a picture here from the Paradise Parking Plots project in Kent done by World Relief. It's, um, I'm gonna go more into the details of it later, but that is specifically a project that did a really good job of centering environmental justice. And I've also got a picture here of the basins for the I-5 Ship Canal Bridge project. So you've got that blue basin down at the bottom where WashDOT is working on a stormwater park to treat runoff coming off of I-5. It's like some of the dirtiest water in the state. And right next to that project is the outfall for the whole red Densmore Basin from King County in Seattle. And um, that has a bunch of Highway 99 runoff and an I-5 runoff in it as well. And if we can, we're doing feasibility studies, WashDOT's doing feasibility study right now um, on how much capacity is at the site to treat. Um, but being able to treat that sort of super outfall in a regional stormwater park would be a huge win for, um, for water quality going into the salmon bearing stream. And so one of the big takeaways, one of the big strategies here is using regional facilities, taking advantage of economies of scale to, to again, bring this up to speed, uh, bring, bring our stormwater treatment up to speed and up to the level of our stormwater quality problem. So go big because home is polluted. Strategy two is make GSI easy. So jurisdictions have the ability to change policies to make GSI easier, or they could keep policies that make GSI hard and still be trying to clean water. So it's easier to make it easy. Um, one, one thing we've talked about is uh, stormwater in parks, working with the parks department. Um, here's a picture of the Aurora Bridge project that TNC was involved in, and um, that did create a, a great park facility um, along the Brick-Gilman Trail. And it also um, is another demonstration of why this is important. It was really a challenging project to build. It was difficult to work with the agencies that were involved um, with WashDOT, with uh, City of Seattle's uh, public utilities and Department of Transportation. And that was a private developer saying, I want to pay to treat the dirtiest water coming off of our highways. And it was still very challenging. So um, making it easy for, and then in the next slide, we'll talk about this more, but making it easy for uh, outside uh, investment to come in and treat our stormwater so that our agencies can focus on the big regional facilities. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that we are working with WashDOT and I-5 and um, it has been really a joy to work with them. Uh, I also mentioned CBP3s here. We heard a little bit about that from City of Seattle earlier. Um, Community-based public-private partnerships is a model that's working very successfully in Maryland right now and is a way to both focus on community interests and priorities and also um, address some of the needs of agencies such as staffing and maintenance concerns. And so we see that as a really promising strategy, both for stormwater parks regionally and um, on a smaller scale as well. So strategy two was make GSI easy. Strategy three is show me the money. It's obviously gonna be quite expensive to uh, retrofit the entire Salish Sea Basin. 
Uh, there's a lot of roads. And so we've got to find out ways to make this cheaper, make this more efficient. Um, one of the ways that City of Tacoma is using is an in lieu fee system. So offsite stormwater management means they've built this prairie line trail um, facility and a couple of other regional facilities in the Theophos watershed. And we're getting the water quality benefits of those facilities now. And then over time, as developers um, build in those watersheds, they'll pay back into the project through that in-loop fee. So that's just one way to um, prioritize water quality now and bring the money in um, to, to be able to do that. Another picture here is the swale on Yale in Seattle, where the city partnered with a private developer to have the land to build this regional facility that treats um, over 400 acres of runoff coming off of Capitol Hill. Two, two more points that I don't have on here, um, but I think are really important in a, in a money uh, conversation are that the federal government has unprecedented amounts of infrastructure money out there right now. So it is a great time to be building regional stormwater facilities. And then also WashDOT has $500 million over 16 years from the Move Ahead Washington package to be working on stormwater. And um, our, I talked to Tony over here this morning. They are looking for partners. They have the dirtiest water in most of our communities. And um, it's, it's right there waiting to be treated. So they have money and um, working together can help buy down the cost for both WashDOT and for the um, local jurisdictions. So strategy three, show, show me the money. If you uh, have seen the step up or if you listen to the step up soundtrack, that's uh, entertaining for me every time I come back to that. Strategy four is maximize impact with multiple benefits. So we want, we want to be ensuring that these projects support community. And this goes back to environmental justice, which I mentioned in that first slide. Um, so specifically the Paradise Parking Flats project in Kent. It's at Hillside Church. It was done with World Relief. And they went to the large immigrant and refugee community that is in that area. And first of all, they're citing a project in that community. And they um, asked what the community needed and heard uh, gathering space and access to culturally important foods. And so they created this uh, community garden. They really responded directly to those needs and created this community garden where um, people can come together and grow those culturally important foods. And they also put in several rain gardens, a bioswale, um, cisterns. So it's also a, a large stormwater facility. Um, and that, that is just one example of project supporting community in siting and design. And then in construction as well, it's a chance we're talking about investment as healing today. Um, and construction is really where the money, uh, the rubber meets the road when it comes to money. And so contracting with um, local businesses, with small businesses, with women and BIPOC owned businesses is one way that um, our stormwater projects can really invest in our communities. And, and also uh, planning and designing for climate resilience. Um, is going to be as we build infrastructure that's going to be around for a long time. That's critical for the future of our communities. And so, strategy four was maximize benefits. Strategy five is build decision maker support, um, communicating those benefits you just maximized. And I don't know uh, how much Erica went into this, but I know in her slides there's a point that uh, it's really helpful to have political support for these stormwater projects. And um, being able to show the value of all of the different multiple benefits to decision makers and to our politicians and having them champion this work is really critical. So to go full circle, uh, Erica's project um, and that, that guidance document and the case stories involved are also one of the case stories in the white paper. Um, so recommend you go check it out. It's a really cool project to learn from. And, um, is an important strategy, is, is acting out an important strategy to build decision maker support for, for regional stormwater facilities. So please do check out the white paper. There's a lot more in it. Um, feel free to let me know how you use it, if you use it, um, if it helps convince your bosses to do big regional facilities and accelerate the pace of our GSI treatment of road runoff. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Kate for another tool. All right, hello everyone, um, I am Kate, and I'm gonna take us a little bit more tactical. So today I am presenting a scope of work template. Um, it's currently available as a draft through me, 
so please reach out, um, and to be released later this spring with a few case studies that I will be sharing here. So um, our vision, why we did this, um, as Josh mentioned, we want to speed up infrastructure portfolios in pollution hotspots while supporting communities, knowing that we have to think bigger. Um, anecdotally, this project, um, well, actually, this project began after hearing from two jurisdictions that they spent more than a million dollars getting to prioritize basins, leaving no money left over for the projects themselves. <clears throat> so this is a tool um, to get through the planning phase faster and cheaper so we can get to implementation. Um, so the intention is that um, a jurisdiction, a, an individual working, can take this template, personalize it to meet their needs, which means you can start at any of the tasks described here. Um, and with the end product, getting you to a feasibility assessment that's useful in applying for design funds, prioritizing existing funding, or like Josh said, advocating for implementation of stormwater parks um, in your current work structure. Okay, so I'm going to go through each task, demonstrating a few highlights and examples of deliverables for each step. Um, please note this presentation is not all inclusive. There are more steps, there are more deliverables, so um, reach out. All right, so task zero. This um, is likely an assumed task that everyone assumes happens um, effectively, but we wrote it in here um, to make sure that the vision and the intention of whoever is using the scope of work is communicated clearly. Um, knowing that clear alignment will ensure the vision is carried throughout the project um, and decisions, empowering the consultant to make recommendations you might not have thought of. Um, for the case studies I am going to be going through, um, we worked with parametrics. I think Nikki might be here today. Shout out to Nikki. You're great. Hey, Nikki. Um, and so uh, the goals that we communicated, so we are looking or working in a portion of the Green River. Um, we wanted to identify a high impact area with a high pollutant load, prioritizing communities that have higher health disparities that may not have access to green space um, and suffer a higher environmental burden, um, as well as identifying the opportunities for integration of community co-benefits while prioritizing salmon health, salmon health and recovery in the region. All right, so for task one, excuse me, um, the goal is to select an area of work in a data collection system, and this may already be done for many of your phase two jurisdictions with your SMAPs. Um, so initially, um, we settled on a GIS system with an Excel uh, database just to collect uh, relevant information. Our basin, the greater watershed, was broken down into sub-basins for analysis um, with the ultimate goal of selecting one of these sub-basins for intervention. So um, data information gathering review, there are many sources outlined in this scope of work template. Um, I'm just gonna show you a few um, and I'll breeze through them really quickly so we have time for questions. Um, so the first was pulling pollution hotspots. Um, this information was pulled from the stormwater heat map um, and shows high priority areas where pollutant load and intervention um, would be particularly effective. So next, um, we pulled information about species specific priorities. Um, this information was pulled and it described migration, spearing migration, spawning and rearing. Ultimately, we decided to focus on the spawning and rearing areas um, for higher species impact. Okay, so for water quality, this is an example of when um, Parametrics, Nikki specifically, um, was able to outline or suggest different data sources. So we listed and mapped all 303D water listings. Turns out, every sub-basin has a listed area. And so we were able to integrate um, BIBI scores to assess different water quality. Um, we mapped the combined equity index using the Washington Health Disparities to identify the basins um, and mapped um, tribal lands to understand what impact we could have on tribal rights. There's many more resources and definitely work with your tribal liaison um, to communicate with your partners in the area. All right. So ultimately, we landed with two prioritized basins that were in Kent. We reached out to Kent, and right around that time, they were publishing their SMAP, and it looks like we have excellent alignment and are going to be moving forward with Kent, pulling in information that we didn't have before, um, usually suggested in task one. We're going to be going forward with in task two. All right, so we are just beginning this work with Kent, so I don't have too much to present from the case study there. Um, <coughs> But here are some examples of the layers um, where you can get higher discretization than you did at the larger scale. 
Um, we have some examples of deliverables from this process. One um, Josh already mentioned here at the I-5 Ship Canal Bridge leading into the Densmore Basin that originally came from a feasibility study using a similar scope of work that identified um, bridge runoff in the Lake Union area where we were focusing on intercepting highly polluting and high volume toxic runoff. Great, so task three. So in this task, the goal is to identify potential sites and narrow for a detailed feasibility assessment. We did this work in partnership with Kent, or nope, sorry, Tacoma. Um, that was task one and two. So um, executing this task in partnership with Tacoma, focusing on the Tacoma Mall area where they had an existing sub area plans. So in this, you'll do a block scale analysis. This is the desktop review, ultimately leading to five to 10 site visits themselves to um, ground truth your analysis and assess the, the willingness of partners to get to a final short list of sites. All right, so in task four, this is when you are gonna screen and select your preferred project sites. Um, this, site, this will include detailed site evaluation going into much more detail. Um, there's many categories of recommended for review with different data sources, um, but ultimately what is considered in the site scoring matrix is up to you and the consultant based on differences in opportunities. Um, in in um, Tacoma, we identified um, some primary project sites and are happy to be moving forward in conjunction, moving forward in conversations um, with Tacoma and Tacoma Parks to hopefully get some projects in the ground. All right, now, um, but wait, there's more. Um, this wasn't on the agenda. Um, but I wanted to share with you, um, our Washington chapter has just launched a brand new free self-based and online tribal engagement training series called Indian Country 101 in partnership with the Whitener Group. This training contains foundational knowledge for any non-Native person hoping to partner productively with tribes in North America and Washington State. Our partners at the Whitener Group weave together authentic commentaries, always keeping Native voices at the forefront. Curated content was designed to be robust, comprehensive, and acknowledgement of the diversity of Indian country itself. If, if any of you are like me and know less than you should, I highly recommend this training um, to understand the context in which we can work and restore our lands. All right, so we have some gratitudes and thanks, but I believe moving on to questions. Thank you, everyone. Let's give them a round of applause. I think, are there any questions from the virtual room or in the physical room? Go ahead, David. Uh, we have one from an anonymous attendee. Uh, this is probably in the planning and design studies for the various projects, but can the panel briefly touch on how stormwater and park functionalities are worked out with access, accessibility, and safety needs, as well as property management and maintenance responsibilities. This one's on. Um, so in Kirkland, when we design a project, we work very closely with our maintenance division and with our parks division to make sure that this, whatever we build can be taken care of. Um, I would also say that in Kirkland, most of our facilities actually end up being underground because land is just so scarce and there's so many demands on any given park that uh, it ends up that our stormwater is usually in you know, vaults or other types of underground facilities. So. I just want to plug the CDP3 model as a one to further explore. I don't think we have time to go deeply into it right now, but it does help address some of those uh, concerns with maintenance and responsibilities. Okay, I'm gonna say that into the microphone. We have a plug for the CDP3 model in session 3B. Uh, the first step in the guidance is to um, get together with an interdisciplinary team. So ac across the agency, um, and that can really help um, kind of understand what all the issues are. And if you address them early on, you can figure out uh, how to how to you know deal with them. And also sometimes having a formal agreement uh, pr can provide comfort so that you know, okay, this maintenance need will be taken care of by so-and-so. So there, there are a lot of issues to work through, but it seems like you know bringing that interagency team together can, can really help, um, including the planning department, because they can help with permits. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Go, do you want to go to the mic? They'll run the mic to you. <clears throat> um, this might be like kind of an overly specific question, but Jenny, you had mentioned the AstroTurf in the park. And I was just kind of wondering like how permeable or permeable AstroTurf is in like a park setting. Is that something that you try to use more in parks where, you know, there isn't the possibility of deep infiltration? Like, you know, what's actually like the viability of that in a park? It's a tough one. Uh, from a stormwater perspective, uh, water quality treatment and flow control are required for artificial turf. So on the downside, it makes your stormwater life that much harder. On the upside, people really need places to play and be active all year round. Um, and if parks needs that stormwater management, we can show up and add to it. So, <laughs> so it's both sort of a opportunity and a challenge. Uh, this is a class 101 now. So a uh, question for panelists and also Jenny about the infiltration plan and also the bioretention cells that you mentioned. Why does the CD consider one to be better than the other one? What are the factors and uh, what are the benefits for both and the uh, comparison of the both? Thank you. Yeah, so we like to infiltrate stormwater whenever we can because that recharges stream flow during the water, during the summer, sorry, when, when stream flow. Uh, so we try to use infiltration as our preferred method of stormwater management whenever we can. Um, we have to do our homework, obviously, to make sure we aren't going to cause landslides or, you know, seeps or other other problems. But that is our preferred method because of the stream flow. Um, and instead of just slowing the water down, you're really putting it back into the into the ground and into the ecosystem. So, um, yeah. And if we can't do that, if our soils just aren't aren't going to let us do that, then we look at other types of facilities like above ground bioretention. Are there any other questions? I have a couple that we could ask too. More a live stream question here. Um, how does the partnership work with the city of Tacoma given their challenges with local governance? I don't know if you, oh, the partnership, do you wanna go? Sure. Um, so in, so we have um, an established relationship in Tacoma, in the Tacoma Mall area, um, working on greening urban tree planting programs there. And so our partnership um, or our collaboration was with the city and um, they will be the ones taking it forward in conjunction with the Parks Department. And we would love to facilitate and support um, as that project um, can move forward. Like I said, at the end of this feasibility, assessment. The intention is to get to design funding. Um, and so using this, leveraging it and creating a funding application would be a viable next step. That's the stop sign. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining today's um, this breakout session and thank you to our speakers for presenting on all your great work.